Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am Suzanne Hidi, and together with Daphne Maurer, we have put this together for you today, and we hope it's all going to be terrific and you will have a great and enjoyable day. Before I invite our principal, Peter Russell, to say a few words to you, I would like to thank our committee for helping us put this together, and I would like to ask them, the names are on the program on the first page, to please stand up for a moment. And now, Peter Russell, please welcome our guest. Well, welcome, fellows of senior college and members and friends, and a particularly warm welcome to the students from the university and the community, and Ann McDonough, one of the organizers, and Joanne McKay. Uh, wonderful to have you with us this morning. The university and the community is uh, Senior College's real outreach uh, in partnership with the Workers' Education Association and in its college. And we're so glad you could uh, join us this morning. Uh, this is our 12th annual uh, senior, well, se start as Senior College uh, Symposium, sorry, Senior Scholars Symposium, now Senior College. Because uh, 12 years ago at Massey about 40 of us gathered to hear four or five of us talk about their continuing intellectual scholarly work in retirement. Uh, that's 12 years ago, and just one damn thing led to another. And this is where we are today. And I think uh, looking at this program, you can see really the, the raison d'etre of, of senior college. Uh, we do bring together across the disciplines uh, outstanding scholars, both in the college and, and and to speak with us. Today we have a mixture of both retired people and and those are still actively engaged in, in, in writing and researching big issues um, across the, the disciplines. And uh, Suzanne Hitty uh, thanked her committee. Let me thank on your behalf uh, Suzanne and her partner, her co-chair, Daphne Moore, uh, vice principal academic of senior college. They really, uh, uh, they had a lot of help from the committee, but uh, they had a ter terrific uh, role in making today possible. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Bank of Montreal that continues to be our corporate sponsor and helps us have a, a really first class event and, create a streaming video which creates, which is an educational resource for schools and, and the public coming out of, uh, of this annual uh, uh, symposium of ours. So uh, enjoy, uh, we've got a great day ahead of us. I'm going to now ask uh, Mary Joy uh, Kellner uh, from the committee uh, to uh, introduce our first speaker and preside over our first session. Thank you, Peter. You know, we know that Peter is retiring as our first and magnificent principal of the college, and uh, I find cer a certain sadness in watching him perform his duties because I know that we're coming close to the end, and we're all we all aware of how important he's been in the in the college. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Barry Wellman. Barry has been a professor of sociology for 47 years and my friend for all those years too. We started our careers here at the U of T together and he's gone on to become an internationally recognized scholar specializing in the impact of the internet on society. Barry served as the S.D. Clark professor for five years and has been the head of many significant associations, such as the Sociological Research Association and the Network for Social Analysis. 
Barry is also the co-author of a best-selling book called Networked, which deals with the ways that the internet has changed our patterns of communication and extended our communities. I know that Barry will do a brilliant job of telling you about those things and about, in particular about the, the general impact of the internet on all our lives. Barry? It's great to be here. And I don't have to mark any exams afterwards. It's wonderful. <laughs> Mary Joy mentioned the International Network for Social Network Analysis, which was founded 40 years ago this year, in 1977, and has grown to be 2,400 people. Uh, but it started with uh, Beverly Wellman sitting there, my companion, as the title says, in a lifelong seminar, which never stops, including at night sometimes, and ably supported by Larry Bourne, the former director of the Center for Urban and Community Studies, may it rest in peace. Thank you so much to both of you. OK, what I'm going to do is talk about, very quickly, I've got 30 slides in 30 minutes. Um, continuing moral panic and fear of losing community, how things changed. We didn't just get to cyberspace on our own. Uh, we changed from groups to network, and I call it the triple revolution, along with the personal internet and also with our mobile phones. You've all shut yours off, though. By the way, we've just done a study of senior citizens in East York. Anybody here living in East York? OK, we may have interviewed you. But uh, one of the things we found with the seniors is they hardly ever text. Maybe it's finger dexterity, I'm not sure. But they, they use phones for this old-fashioned thing called voice. And it was shocking to my younger collaborators uh, to do that. So let's go. Uh, a lot of this is based on the book. I have one copy if anybody wants to, uh, to look at it later. And it's written for the intelligent general audience, which uh, this defines, I would say. So uh, that's great. One of the things we've noticed is uh, big changes in uh, what's happening in societies and the loss of trust. This is from the Pew Research Center. You can see that Congress has, in the 70s, even though that wasn't a good era, Nixon, uh, has declined to a 9% trust, be it Paul Ryan or whatever is, ca is causing that. Can you take that? It's safer. Just put it with my stuff. Yeah. OK. And institutions are just getting a little shaky. And at the same time, we have the sense that people are alienated. I think most people here can remember the song by by the Beatles about Eleanor Rig Rigby, um, who turns out to be a not real woman. She's an alternative news person. But <laughs> Liverpool, <laughs> Liverpool made her real by putting up a statue after the fact on sitting on Stanley Street in, in Liverpool. But there's been recurrent claims over and over again, let's call it Rigby-ish claims, that things are falling apart, that people are alienated. Um, and that, I printed these so small that I can't read them. Um, so everybody has a different reason. Is it urbanization? Is it bureaucratization? Is it industrialization? Is it socialism? Is it capitalism? Or probably a mixture of all of the above. And that, first, uh, Keith Hampton and I, who are writing a paper together, can say, goes back as far as 1377 with Ivan Khaldun. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. Can my type reach to the back there, my typeface? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, and this audience was probably alive with Hobbes and Marx and Engels. So you you kind of remember all that stuff. But except for Marx and Engels, they mostly this were punditry, people writing without systematic evidence, as if they were doing a Globe and Mail op-ed piece or the star on a really bad day. Okay, 
So it's always, oy vey, oy gewalt, the sky is falling, we're always lonely. Um, and, sorry, it's happened even in our new world. I'm sorry, I only have American quotes up now. Um, Tommy Jefferson, the great rebel, uh, in his notes on Virginia, he was happily in, ensconced in his plantation in rural Virginia with his uh, lady friend, but he thought cities were evil, pestilent sores. I'm not gonna read these. Marie Stein, a sociologist in the early 60s, was one of many saying cities are evil. Um, and Tom Brokaw, who many of us watched on NBC Network News, uh, wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. It said, things are bad now, but they're really great in the 1960s. What is going on is each generation looks back and says, we're a mess, as I'm sure we all feel right now, but it was good, better back then. And the thing is, every generation looks back to the previous one. Uh, this is a classic pastoralism notion, uh, which we're all, not, not all, many of us, I, I love living a blur in St. George, but look to the countryside as this wonderful bucolic place. We go up to north to Cremor and we fight the mosquitoes, but we feel, oh, this is true life. But then look at the evil um, railroad train and, and, and industrial revolution kind of coming in. So this pastoral myth, for those of you who are, uh, English majors has been going on a long time. And it, now it's been transferred to the internet. So um, I have a lot of quotes up here which I basically won't, I, you all can read. Um, but basically the, this, the current myth is Facebook is making us lonely. That's nonsense. What do you do on Facebook? You talk to other people. The only real problem that I see and I'm sure you've seen it, walking down Bloor Street, is the people walking like this, and then you have to say, get out of my way, because I exist in real flesh time. But in fact, they're talking to somebody else. They're just not connecting with you. Uh, Bob Putnam wrote a fascinating book with a uh, very bad sample uh, that many of you read, Bowling Alone, for a while. Uh, the federal government took it seriously. But he, he was right in one way. He said, look, our institutions, be it Congress, be it the PTA, be it Lions Clubs, are losing their membership and their ascendancy. But at the same time, he missed the big turn, which, of course, I know all about, <laughs> is uh, the turn to social networks. And that's really where we're going uh, today. By social networks, I don't necessarily mean Facebook. I mean the things that we were all involved in in kids, friendships and stuff, and that we did a lot of great work at the Center for Urban Studies about. Okay, so we're gonna talk about three things. One, the turn to uh, social networks. Two, the growth of the internet, which has some interesting affordances. Obviously, it's long distance. How many people had an email message from across Canada or the US in the past week? How about across the Atlantic, Pacific, or whatever other ocean? Yeah, well, this is a, an atypical audience. Um, at the same time, it's also personalized. When we were kids, the phone rang. My parents wanted to know who I was talking to. A perfume letter came into my house in the Bronx. My mother wanted to know which girlfriend that was. Now the perfume comes directly to you. In fact, um, Bill Galva, who's not here in, in Cambridge, England, has invented a device where he can send you perfume if you're his type. Um, we'll talk about it later. It's a bit of a fudge. The other thing is we've all turned, learned to turn off our mobile phones, but we're always available, we're always accessible, whether we want to or not. In fact, there is a, a very poignant story in the New Yorker magazine, oh, I think about three weeks ago, where people in Iraq uh, the fighters on one side and their loved ones on the other side of the boundary in Mosul were talking to each other. And when the fighters would move maybe uh, half a kilometer away, uh, their relatives would move with them into another ruined house to stay in touch. So mobile is always with us, always available, and allows us to connect across 
a lot of boundaries. So just very briefly, I want to mention that these things didn't arise. Cyberspace networks just didn't aware. Um, most of us have one car. This is a bad slide. Skip it. But most of us have one car per person if we have any reasonable affluence. Whereas when we all were growing up, I can finally say this to an audience instead of talking to teenagers, um, we had a family car. We, we went over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house uh, on the weekend, usually through the snow. So that means that people, and people in this case usually means women, now have autonomy to go where they want to without being dependent on, on the one family car usually written, uh, driven by their husband. Same time, how many people here have been on an airplane in the past year? <laughs> you laugh. I didn't get on until I was 22 for my honeymoon. Uh, and airplane, I mean, it's amazing. I thought I was at a funeral watching all these jackets and ties here today. It's kind of neat. But, you know, it used to be when you flew that way, you dressed up. Now you go in the worst sweats that you can think of, sort of the way I am working around the house these days. Um, but despite the best efforts of Air Canada, American, Delta, and all those guys, uh, air travel is going up on a per capita basis every year. It's gotten cheaper, it goes to more places, and it's even somewhat easier to do with online stuff. Uh, we can all tell war stories about that. And it's safer. I mean, I, we stopped buying insurance for airplane. I don't think they even sell it at, at, at Pearson. Okay, other things are going on. We have fewer kids. That means people are more mobile. We have uh, a lot more people playing with computers. Richard Florida, who's not quite old enough to be here, um, has been talking about the creative class and bit workers. For many years, people are shuffling little bits on their computer around instead of being stuck in factories. So we're more mobile. Women are certainly much more mobile. A lot of stuff is happening. And at the same time, we're, we're less bound to formal institutions. Remember the great movie, 1967, 50 years ago? Yeah. Um, with the most beautiful man in the world, Sidney Poitier, and the, the whole movie was, my God, he's marrying a white woman. And Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn had to, had to uh, adjust to that. I hear from yesterday's Metro, they're gonna remake it, which would be kind of interesting. How, because now we have a huge number, God, huge, can't say huge, Trump. Okay, a large number of people um, just, Marrying interracially, this campus is a hymn to that kind of thing, and it's wonderful. Whereas when I grew up, uh, I, was, I was one of the first Jews at a, at a Christian university, and I wasn't allowed in fraternities, and I'm sure many people here have war stories, including at U of T in the 50s and early 60s, and even implicitly, I would say now, but that's a whole other debate that we can have. Um, we had the riot in Christie Pitts. Yeah about 10 blocks from here in 1933. So we've had a turn, it's what I'm saying is all of these implicit affordances that we usually don't think of as a changing society have really moved us from this kind of setup, we're in little bounded wall pre-industrial villages to this, where we're connected, very much connected as you folks are but we're connected more as individuals. I'm overstating the case, of course, and you can give me many counter kind of thoughts. And we call this, whoops, help, uh, networked individualism. Let me, let me do it now. And what we know now from a bunch of studies that were done at the Center for Urban and Community Studies, um, that people have large networks the, the mean sign the last time I looked, which was 2006, was about, they know 600 people. And they have about a dozen very close ties and about 30 or so more that they're in touch with. We think, and we're doing the research right now in the fourth East York study, that they still have, that they have larger numbers of people they're in contact with, and that's mostly due to Facebook. 
or email. In fact, for seniors, mostly email. This may be an atypical. How many people are actively on Facebook? They actually do stuff. Yeah, about 20% of you. How many people are on Skype? Uh, more, because Skype is just like a phone call if you get the damn thing to work. Yeah. So now I'm jumping way ahead of my slides, but it's a good point. For the first time ever, a majority of older adults, 65 plus, in the US and Canada are on the our broadband internet. We've been the slowest ones to get there, but we've come up. Part of the reasons we've come up is many of us were younger ones. Anybody not been younger ones? Uh, and we started doing it. I started doing it in 1976. I was especially early, but most of you started in the 80s or at worst the 90s. And we have reasons for doing it. So we're in multiple sets of friends, relatives, uh, neighbors. Facebook doesn't get that. It really wants to force us. You know X, and, and Larry knows X, therefore you should be friends with that person, you know, that sort of stuff. No, I don't want to talk to that person, you know, but they keep pushing that one. So we know a lot of stuff. There's too much to read. We have a high volume and velocity of information and communication. Okay, this is maybe curious. How many people checked their email this morning? Wow, <laughs> at 9 o'clock. Uh, Fantastic. How many people lectured in a class where their students were looking at their email or Facebook instead of you? 100%. I used to call on them. They hated me. OK. But we still have bodies. I lectured at computer scientists. Anybody here from computer science? Uh, yeah. And I have to keep telling those guys who do HCI kind of work uh, that people have bodies. That Anybody guess what the most common email uh, is how are you? Okay. Next common instrumental one is: Would you pick up a liter of milk, uh, please tonight? <laughs> so you know, we've changed. That the point of contact is not so much the household anymore. Although many of us, unlike the current generation, are happily married, but is the individual. We're connected, but we're connected as what I call networked individualism, a phrase invented at the Center for Urban and Community Studies in 2000. And this means different. We have multiple networks. They're not very densely connected. It's not a village. We have less hierarchy. We tend to know more people. But we have some costs. We got to calculate where we're going to get help from. You can't get it from, from the village. I don't want to overstate the pastoralism. Um, while writing the TTC, I've been reading Jane Austen uh, sense and Sensibility on Wattpad. And um, one of the things I find is that Jane's, always, Jane's people are always galloping in their carriages and sometimes horses to each other. She doesn't talk much about the servants, but there's a lot of mobility uh, going on there. So we don't re uh, the person's the unit of connectivity, and we have to work hard. And this is the hard part, especially when you get old, in operating your own network. The other thing we found repeatedly in every study, there is no separate world of digital media, the internet, and real life in person. In fact, we don't use the term real life in our project. That almost everybody I'm in contact with, almost everybody we've studied in East York and studied in the surveys I've done with the Pew Internet Research Group are if they know them online, they know them in person. Some people who are still recalcitrant and don't go uh, online. Well, it's about 15% now. And there are a few people who are known only online, but dollars to donuts, they will be met in person when the people get together. The only exception to this is some of your grandchildren. They're called gamers. And game, people who play games tend to only know each other on game life. So people got to calculate where they're getting help. Um, there's some turnover. And then there's the bad stuff that we're just hearing about. Uh, Matt Galloway uh, had a nice uh, interview with Ann Kavuki and was talking later. A lot of electronic surveillance. Both the obvious kind, the RCMP sitting there um, watching you. Watched NCIS last night, as I'm sure many of you do. It's the highest rated show on television. And 
they violate search warrants every week, as far as I can see, and never notice it. They've normalized surveillance. But the other surveillance going on is Facebook, Google, Amazon, anything else, which is accumulating vast quantities of information about you. Right now, it's just tailoring your ad. One of my, my second biggest fear about Trump is that'll start being used in, in, in punitive ways. My biggest fear, of course, is blowing up the world, um, be it North, starting with North Korea or, or Syria, but that's a whole other conversation. We also have a lot of covalence. We know what our friends are doing a lot more than we used to, except in the old village times. In some ways, we're, we're going back to that, although we're segmented. Uh, we know who's going where on vacation and things like that, usually through Facebook or sometimes through the internet. Let me just move up on these. Second thing that's uh, it's also chasing is the nature of households. Not this crowd, but most people in the old days had a kind of Trumpian mode where the, uh, remember fun with Dick and Jane where dad went off to work and mom stayed home and Dick and, and Jane played with their dog. Remember their dog's name? Spot. Spot. Very good. Uh, and, and that's changed. We know, and you know, and most of you participate, that most women have worked a lot in their careers using their mobile cars, maybe getting on their planes, using mobile phones to be connected uh, to get that punch of milk. So uh, the old home work boundary is going on. I work from my home office. Many of you, I'm sure, do. And many younger people do that, too or keep an office or a desk at a, at a corporation or U of T, but only come in a few times. Uh, Larry Bourne and I watched the, the actual resident population of uh, Center for Urban Studies diminishing because people had computers at their home. They were still active members of the center, but they, you know, schlepping in on the TTC is always exciting. Okay, so we've had a lot of changes. Most of us feel good about that. It is a lie that people are upset about the internet and cyberspace. It's a lie propagated by op-ed pages. The business pages on the Times or the Globe, et cetera, know it's wonderful. They love cyberspace, but the op-eds still, oh my God, stuff like that. Um, I just talked about this basically. We're online. Uh, one of the things that really surprised us, and we're just doing the study now, is people want to talk on the internet more to their friends than their relatives. Well, they have more friends than relatives, uh, especially as we all get older. But uh, their friends are more physically dispersed. And they say, oh, the relatives, they'll be there for me if I want to. The other thing we're finding, how many people have given help to others about how to navigate the internet or Facebook and stuff? Yeah. How many people have asked for help? An embarrassing question. OK, including at least a very good friend of mine here. Yeah. So. One of the new kinds of social capital is knowing how to do internet stuff or how to download apps onto iPhones and stuff. And we're finding out seniors find that ability or access to that ability is extremely um, important to them. So we talked about this before. I've got to wrap up. Age is not a static category. Some people are forced into it. How many people were forced into the internet because they had to be? One. Okay, and some shy people. Or lured into it either by porn or by jobs or by just keeping up with information. You don't think senior citizens do porn? Boy. Um, remember I did a study up in Chapleau, Northern Ontario, and one of our respondents said, Professor Wellman, the internet's like sex. Uh, the trouble is the more you get on the internet, the less you have sex. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, oops. in a nutshell, I just want to wrap up. It's coming 10 o'clock. Uh, people are very networked, but they network more as individuals. They're functioning. Families are also the same way. Their networks are larger now. They're integrating cyber stuff, be it digital media, uh, internet, and phone with going on. And the more they do it, the more they're in contact with people. One is not a substitute for the other. But these are very different, more interest-based communities. The old boundaries, even in the US, I, I will seriously contend, and it's a long talk, that the Trumpian uh, 
reaction is like the Thermidor von Day reaction that former professor here, Charles Tilly, used to talk about. It's a last gasp. And in fact, it's falling apart as we speak. Um, but we're now growing up. We're mostly online, and we're mostly doing email, unlike uh, many of our other colleagues. And I welcome you to the world of networked individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. That was really very comprehensive, wasn't it? I mean, I feel like my whole life has been discussed. I want to uh, thank you with a small token uh, from the senior college. This is a book called Struck by Lightning, The Curious World of Probability by uh, Jeffrey Rosenthal. It's just a small token of our appreciation, Barry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Onward. Our next speaker is Steve Laderonte. Yes. I pronounced it correctly, good. Steve is the managing editor of Digital News at the CBC, where he's responsible for editorial innovation and digital storytelling across all of the company's platforms. Before joining the CBC, Steve was the head of News for Twitter, Inc., as well as the head of News and Government Partnerships for Twitter Canada. And prior to that responsibility, he was the media reporter at the Globe and Mail. So we feel very fortunate that he's taken the time to come and talk to us today, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Steve. <clears throat> Hi there. I'm not going to use any slides, uh, just because I think uh, most of this is stuff I could just talk about a lot easier. Uh, thank you for having me and finding the tallest podium for the smallest uh, person in the room. I, I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm Steve Laderante, and I'm the managing editor of Digital News at CBC. I've been there for about a year. Um, my job has actually changed in the last week or two. I'm also um, taking over as managing editor of The National. Um, and I'm sort of the journalist in charge of ruining it for everybody once Peter Mansbridge retires. Um, so um, that'll be in uh, July when he stops, and then we'll transition to some sort of new show um, in the coming weeks, months after that. And this is great, because this is like looking out at the CBC focus group out here. Um, um, how many of you uh, get a daily newspaper on your doorstep every day? Wow. Like, you're our people, right? How many people watch nightly news? Wow. Is this, like, this never happens when I speak in a room. Everybody's like, <laughs> like, what is a newspaper? I walked down my street the other day. I live in Pickering, um, and I followed the guy that dropped off my paper. One guy delivers five newspapers, right? So all the chains and everything. He stopped at one other door, and he put a, door, a newspaper on the doorstep, and then he ran back out and grabbed it and put it back in his truck because it was the wrong house, and he drove away. One house in my neighborhood in a new subdivision. So you, you're not typical, right? But we love you because, you know, this is sort of the the people that we need to keep, that we've kept going and interestingly you know for the national the average age of the audience of the national is incrementally increasing with each quarter it doesn't go 65 one quarter 66 the next it goes 58 62 68 why because the people that used to transition into news you know you get married you settle down you buy an ACTV, you get a cable subscription you subscribe to the globe and mail all those things that were sort of signs of adulthood um, don't happen anymore. Those people don't transition in, so that age incrementally increases. So the great challenge of news, of course, is how do you reach that new audience? So I'll back up a little bit. I'm going to jump all over the place, but that's okay. Um, and a lot of the, the things that we spoke about earlier are very pertinent to the way that we're thinking about news now, because it is about a connected world. It is about the way we talk to each other, the way we consume information. Um, you know, most of us don't have that common currency anymore of getting the same newspaper on the doorstep every morning. Right? And when you think about the fragmentation of, of thought of what's happening in the United States, what's going to happen here? 
that all feeds into the same thing. So uh, before I really get in, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I started, um, well, I'm going to back up even further than that. My dad was a newspaper person. Uh, so he worked at the Ottawa Citizen for 42 years. When he started, it was the 1960s. He's a printer, a composing room guy, not a reporter. There was a bucket of molten lead in the middle of the room that they would make letters out of. Right? It's not that long ago. It sounds like, it, like medieval times, and it hadn't changed since medieval times. Literally a bucket of hot lead. They would dip rulers into it and fling it at each other because it would harden in the air and hit them. Right? So it's amazing any of them are even alive anymore, um, but they are. And um, so they would make letters, and they would put them all, and they'd spell everything backwards and upside down on a plate. That plate would go to the printer. It would make a, a sort of a negative, and they would roll it on the newspapers. You'd get a newspaper. Um, a few years later, they transitioned to, to printers, laser printers, and they would take X-Acto knives, print out a story, cut it in pieces, and then stick it on a page with glue, take a picture of that, bring it to the press. Right? So that's sort of through the 1980s. When I went to journalism school around 1997, uh, I was able to do his entire job, a night's work, in about 15 minutes on a computer, right? And that technology hadn't transitioned into the citizen yet. Um, I was able to lay out pages. I was able to edit. If you wanted to edit a story, even in the 80s, you had to take an X-Acto knife and cut the word out that you didn't like and put in your new word, right? It, it, it sounds crazy, but it's true. And then finally, by the time he retired not that long ago, his job consisted of pressing a button about once every 18, 19 minutes for three hours a night and then kind of sitting around the rest, right? So huge change just in the technology of how newspapers come together. So by the time I came in, I was the last person to use film in a camera in my journalism school. That was all gone, automation processes. Um, none of that's bad, right? It, it allows reporters to go out and do different things. You could stop wasting your time developing negatives. Um, you don't need to worry about inhaling hot lead all day um, unless you're into it, which apparently some of them were. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you could just focus on the journalism. Uh, so I went to school, I went to the Ottawa Sun as my first job, where we didn't have the internet. This is 1998, there was one computer in a corner. You plugged in your computer, you did your internet stuff, you unplugged it, somebody else used the phone on that line when you were done, right? So you kind of fast forward, did a bunch of different jobs. I went to the Ottawa Business Journal in um, 2000, where we started an online news service, um, which was revolutionary at the time, where we would basically, um, I mean, basically what we did is we, we rewrote Globe and Mail stories and put them on the internet and, and called them ours, and, um, you know, it was a source of great amusement when I finally made it to the globe. Um, but it was revolutionary in a way because we were doing breaking news in a market uh, that was in the middle of a tech boom. The desire for information was huge and it, you, know, you had to wait till the next day. So it just didn't make any sense. So by the time I left there, uh, we had grown the paper itself from 14 pages to 144 a week. We had seven full-time journalists doing online news. Then the tech bubble burst. Advertising went away. We went back down to 12 pages. I got fired and I went to work in Peterborough for a couple of years. Right, so um, technological change is fast and, and it's relentless. Um, ended up at the Globe and Mail where, um, again, I landed there and the paper was this thick on my desk the day I got there. This is 2006. Not kidding, it was a Monday, it was like that. Had a career section, it had a travel section, had inserts, it had a TV section, like, it, it was huge. And I remember looking at it and thinking, like, I never need to work anywhere for the rest of my life. Like, I have got it made finally. And every quarter it got a little bit smaller. And when it lands on your doorstep now, you don't even hear it. Right? Unless it's a Saturday and then sometimes you do. It's also shrunk, right? It's smaller. Uh, and that's all a result of the financial pressures that, that everybody's going through. And, um, you know, just to give you a sense of the perspective of that, uh, Post Media did me the great favor of releasing their second quarter results this morning. And, um, you know, I'm obsessed with this. I covered media at the Globe for a long time. These numbers matter. Canadian media isn't dying, it's already dead, right? That is a reality. Uh, Post Media in the last quarter lost $26 million in a quarter. Right? So think about what, pop, what papers they own. They own, you start in Windsor, the Windsor Star. You can go to the Ottawa Citizen, Montreal Gazette, Sask both Saskatoon dailies, two dailies in Ottawa, actually, the Sun. They own all the Sun papers. They own two papers in most markets now. They own the Vancouver papers. And they own more than 300 weeklies across the country. These small papers go into everybody's house and tell you what's happening at City Hall. You don't get that information anywhere else right now. That's the only place it exists. That's not sustainable. They're caring about... I think it's most recent, $500 million in debt to hedge funds. Hedge funds don't care about the newspaper industry. They care about getting returns. How is Post Media doing that? They're, they're extending lines of credit. They're getting different financing rates. They're counting on the dollar exchange being in their favor. They're selling real estate. They're running out of real estate. Eventually, you run out of real estate. Eventually, you can't refinance. They're going to get to a place where it's completely feasible that there will be no daily newspaper in most Canadian cities within what? Any guesses? Year? Five years? Yeah. Three months? Six months? 
Seriously. Half a million dollars, or $500 million debt, losing $26 million a quarter. Let's go a little deeper on that. So in the last six months, uh, they've lost 22% of their print advertising. Right? So in dollar amounts, actual dollar amounts, here it is, um, $64 million lost in print advertising. Oh, sorry, it's much worse. It's uh, $56 million. Right? Revenue from subscriptions down 10%, which is another $11.6 million. Digital's the future, though, right? That's great. We're going to all consume digital news. For every, for every dollar that you make in digital, you've lost 17 in real-world pr print dollars, right? So $17, you lose that in print, you only earn a dollar back in the digital world, even if you're doing really well, right? The business model doesn't translate. So that's kind of where we're at. So I'll give you um, that you know, exciting, encouraging piece. Uh, you know, some of that is, is consumer behavior. Some of that is um, squarely on the back of the news industry for mismanaging its own business for so long. And I'll get into that as we get closer to the finish. I do believe that the biggest problem the news industry has isn't that it was bad at doing business. It isn't that the business models have changed. It's that they stopped listening to their audiences about 20 years ago, if they ever did at all. And that led people to other places. And you know, I'll get there and talk about that a little bit. In a minute, once I catch my breath because I speak too fast, and I know that's not going to change. I'm from the Ottawa Valley, and uh, this is actually quite slow for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about CBC a little bit because that's you know where my, my head is at right now and just sort of give you a sense of where we stand in the Canadian media landscape. So when I say that Canadian media is dead, um, you know, I do mean that. Uh, you know, Post Media is in a lot of trouble. Tour Star is in trouble with pension obligations. And if CBC lost its government appropriation, it would last about 17 minutes before everybody went home for the day and stayed there, right? So, you know, there's different models. There's different ways this works. But CBC has a unique place in that it's mandated to provide information to Canadians wherever they are, however we can. We're not as beholden to advertising. We're not as beholden to sort of the ebb and flow of of commerce, so that gives us an opportunity to really reach more people and sort of the, the mandate is to reflect Canadians back to themselves, right? Um, haven't done a great job of listening to them, as I said, and I'll talk more about that. But every month, digitally, and I'm going to talk mostly about digitally in the context of CBC because that's, that's where I come from. You know, radio is very strong and TV, like TV everywhere, is, you know, stepping back, stepping back, stepping back. But digital growth has been very strong, which for CBC is important because the job is to reach every Canadian wherever they are. It's not to sell them news wherever they are. Right? For me, a victory is if you see the story, not if you pay for it. You already pay for it. Right? We can't put up a paywall at CBC. We can't charge you because you've already paid. Right? There is a paywall. It's like the great Canadian paywall. But we reach about 18 million Canadians a month digitally. Right? So a little more than half. It's pretty good. Uh, when you consider that includes you know, babies um, and you know, people that don't read the news. Pretty good. And that's increased um, about 30% in the last year. It's the number one... Uh, digital news brand in Canada by far. Uh, next behind us is Post Media. Again, that's, you know, who knows what happens there. But um, when, you, when you get to the audience of CBC, though, of course, it's an aging audience, right? That's just the way it is, and that's true across all media, but it's more true at CBC than anywhere else. But interestingly, as we talk about getting more people to consume news, the people we're really interested in growing that aren't there are 25 to 40-year-olds, really, right? You're not going to get an 18-year-old to read the news typically. They may bounce in and out and they see things on their feed. But the actual core people that we're interested in reaching are you know, getting more of those 25 to 40-year-olds on board. We have more of them than any other news organization in Canada as part of our audience, which is, yay, super, that's amazing. Um, but as an overall proportion of our audience, because we have a big audience, it's actually much smaller than everyone else. right? So more people, more millennials, but other brands have less people and more millennials by percentage, right? So you think of something like Vice or uh, BuzzFeed. They attract more people in that age bracket um, proportionally, but not by number. So we, we're starting from a position of strength and that we have these people coming anyway. Uh, we just need more of them if we're going to maintain our sort of current size and influence. So where does the news industry have to go? It goes on your phones, right? Um, there's no doubt that the future of news is uh, handheld mobile devices. That's where people are consuming information. Um, we talked a little bit about social media in the last one. Um, I worked at Twitter for three years, uh, going around the world trying to figure out how you get news to people it, the way they want it. And the quest it's not a question of, you know, how do you make a better newspaper? How do you do a better broadcast? It's how do you get it onto their mobile devices in a way that, that keeps them there and keeps them engaged and keeps them coming back. So the great challenge for news is most people uh, will read an article on Facebook. 
right? You read the article on Facebook, 80% of them, when you ask them afterward, where did that article come from? You know what they say? Facebook. They don't say CBC. They don't say Globe and Mail. They say Facebook, right? So there's, there's a challenge there for news brands, you know, in the branding side of it, certainly, and, um, but they're so beholden on, on digital for growth that they're willing to accept that. So CBC's audience, digitally, largely um, had been from desktop traffic over the, you know, in the beginning. CBC.ca, the news site, is 20 years old, right? This isn't a new thing. Facebook's even older, you know, is what, 15 years old now? Twitter's 10 years old, none of this is new. But now, today, 71% of CBC's digital audience never goes to the website. It's all smartphones, right? So the vast majority of people don't consume CBC News on a desktop computer, which is the way we build it, the way we think of it. Um, so digital audience, desktop has stayed the same, so you think of a band sort of staying the same. People go to work, they read it there, but that's not their main way they read it. Tablets, everybody got a tablet like five years ago, and nobody ever bought a tablet after that. So that stays steady and it stays uh, you know, across. Uh, it tends to be people 60 and above that prefer tablets, and, and me. Um, I'm 41, so I think I'm getting closer to that than the younger cohort. My in-laws only read news on a tablet now. They're in their 70s. Um, they really like it, but that's not a growing segment for us. The growing segment is smartphones, which exponentially increases every quarter. And you can see that in the, in the data. So again, how people come to us on the desktop, they all came from typing in cbcnews.ca. That's how you get to CBC, right? You go look at it. And about 20% came from social media. In the new world, where everybody's coming to us via mobile, almost 70% of people come to our news via social media, right? That's huge. It's like we're building all these distribution networks. You know, we're building apps, we're trying to reach people, but really, the technology companies, the Twitters, the Facebook, the Snapchats, they have billions of dollars to devote to keeping you on their platform, right? Facebook is a genius company at keeping you in your phone. That's what they exist to do. The more you look at Facebook, the more money they make. We'll never develop a product that good. Right? We will never build a product that can distribute content like Facebook can. But we're on Facebook, but there's a sacrifice there. I talked about the, you know, giving up the, the, um, the branding, giving up some of the, the revenue, although there are revenue opportunities. Uh, but it really does change the way we think. And then when we get to the fake news question, which you know, everybody asks about, you know, that feeds into that as well, because it's a lot easier for people to sort of gamify and change the news flow using social media networks. I actually don't believe fake news is the big problem. Everybody makes it out to be, just as an aside. I think um, the US broadcasters, this is going to sound like you know, truth or 9-11 stuff, but I think a lot of the, the broadcasters and newspapers in the States that got um, sideswiped by the Trump phenomenon were looking for a scapegoat and they really pushed that fake news angle really hard. There's no doubt uh, there was misinformation through the last election campaign, but there's also no doubt that those media companies, you know, including, including mine and others, uh, completely missed that story and are looking for, um, for scapegoats. Anybody know what the number one um, social network is in your age network? Say 55 plus? So Facebook by far? And when you guys put up your hands, and not many of you put up for Facebook, I was surprised. Because 90% of people uh, 55 and older in Canada report having used Facebook at least once a day a month um, in the last year. And after that, it's YouTube. Right? People are going to YouTube for news. They're watching it there. So there you have it. So I'm going to take you now uh, sort of to, you know, now that we know what the, you know, the landscape looks like and what the sort of challenges facing the news industry look like, um, we can get to something more interesting, which is what do we do next, right? So if, if people aren't willing to pay for news, but people, you know, we, we kind of fundamentally agree that people should get news, right? Everybody put up their hand, they get a newspaper. There's a reason for that, right? It's because you think that news is important. You think there's a common dialogue that happens. Uh, you think that there's a value in that. Uh, that's not necessarily believed by everybody. We need to change that. So um, for me, um, the problem is the way that media organizations have listened to their audiences and reacted to the things that they have heard over the years. So when you think about the organizations now that are growing, you think of things like Breitbart, right? So everybody's like, ah, Breitbart, or Rebel Media in Canada, Ezra Levant. What are they doing? Why are they so successful? Ezra Levant, um, if you don't know him, uh, controversial Canadian journalist slash, I don't even know what you would call him, uh, provocateur, entrepreneur. He was on Sun News, he ran the Alberta Western Standard. Um, he's built something called Rebel Media. He's got 600,000 YouTube subscribers. He's got 30 full-time staff members. And if we were to watch the videos now, I can almost guarantee we'd all go, oh my God, I can't believe he's saying these things. And uh, you know, he's poking people, he's, he's going very far out of his way to provide sort of counter 
intuitive news stories to debunk the, what the mainstream media is telling you, right? So I contend that his 600,000 YouTube followers have nothing to do with the content of what he's producing. Has something, but not a lot. What people are buying into his, is his belief in what he's talking about, right? He's listening to them and he's responding to their concerns. He's going too far sometimes, but they feel like they're being heard. So you have people, and this happened in the States too, and I spent a lot of time sort of researching this. And you know, I worked on Donald Trump's campaign when I was at Twitter. Like we'd go to places and show them how to tweet. And um, you know, but what, what they tap into is the sense that nobody's listening to them, right? It's not that, you know, it's not, they're all not crazy racists and they all don't believe in keeping people out of the country. And it shows time and time again when you say, actually, it means the baker on your street's going to get deported. Everybody's like, oh, not, not that Muslim guy. He's great. It's, you know, the other ones, get, you know, not the ones I know. Um, but they, they hear something there that they weren't getting from the mainstream media. And that's, that's sort of the fault of the mainstream media for for not being uh, responsive enough. We're very good about going into the Rust Belt and writing stories about what's happening there. We're not very good about going into the Rust Belt and writing stories for the people who live there. Right? It's a very important difference and you get alienated and, and they kind of go away. So um, there's a, a saying in Denmark and this is where a lot of this thinking comes from is that it's, it's difficult to make smart decisions when the toilet is on fire. And uh, <laughs> I've got a slide, I'm not gonna show up but it's actually flaming toilets. Um, but, you know, the news industry is that toilet that's on fire, right? It's, you know, we're trying to make decisions. We're, we're jumping on things to try to lash out. We're, we're, we're grappling at things. But what we need to do is rebuild trust more than anything else and start listening to the people who consume news. Um, so I have a story from my time at the Globe and Mail. And this is what sort of made me leave journalism. I left for three years because I was just done with the way we were doing news. Didn't really realize it at the time until I left. I'm like, wait a minute, that's why. Um, so you may remember the Bell Let's Talk campaign, right? Every year you talk, text, Bell gives five cents. At the end of it, they would give a couple million dollars to mental health research, everybody's happy, um, except for everybody on the internet who are never happy about anything and come to this with a great deal of cynicism every year. They're like, why does Bell put their name on it? This is so self-serving, you know, I'm not supporting that. Um, so I was the media reporter at the Globe and I said to Bell, like, let's just do a story about the online cynicism, right? Like, why do you put your name on that campaign anyway? You know, why do you have to put your name on it? Why don't you just give them the money without making a big commercial event of it? And all day long, uh, Mark Langton is the guy at Bell who, um, who handles their communications, and I worked with a lot. He just say, kept saying, no, we're not going to do it because you're just going to screw us on this. You know, we're going to end up looking bad. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you're going to screw us. He's like, no, 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 it's going to be good. So finally, at the end of the day, he decides he's going to let me do this. They give me this, the person who's running the campaign for Bell, and we talk and we talk. It turns out you know, she worked at CAMH for 10 years, got many, many corporate donations. Nobody would ever put their money on that corporate donation because they didn't want their donation and their brand to be associated with mental health, health initiatives, right? Good story, that's actually really interesting. People wanted to distance themselves, although they were willing to give the money. She's also um, had brothers uh, that killed themselves. You know, very emotional, very real reason why Bell does this. And there's other things too, but that's the most important stuff. So I do the interview, I write the story, I go home that night, and um, Simon Haupt, who's another reporter, phones me and says, you should probably phone, they're doing something to your story. And the Globe has a clause in the contract, you can't change a comma in a Globe and Mail story without phoning the reporter to get authorization, right? So I'm like, nah, they'll just phone me if they need to. Um, and I went to bed. And the next morning I woke up to a screaming email from, from Bell, say, you know, basically telling me where to shove my story. And I thought like, that's funny, I wrote a really nice story. So I went to the doorstep, because I'm the one guy in my neighborhood who still gets a newspaper. I opened it, and the headline, about this big, was Bell cashes in on mental health. I was like, how did that happen, right? Like, that's not what my story was at all, but they had gone back into the story and decided it wasn't edgy enough, and they had somebody scour Twitter and start inserting quotes into the story to get the other side into it, right? Which is just a really shitty thing to do. Like, that's not what that was about. So I totally understood why Bell was, was upset, and the Globe completely... You know, Bell said they were going to pull advertising. They tried to get me fired. Um, it, was, it was a big deal. And the next day, we gave the whole report on business section to Bell to write puffy stories for themselves uh, to make up for it. But, but it was one of those moments where you just realize, like, maybe we're not doing this right. Maybe we're not really reflecting a true version of the world. And you think of things. In France, if you ask somebody in France, what proportion of your population is Muslim? The answer is 32%. That's what people think, right? The actual real number is 8%. How do those people vote? Where are they going to go, right? What are they, what are they scared of? Um, in, in Italy, if you ask people what the unemployment rate is, they will say 47%. 
it's 12. That's Bersco, you know, the Bersolini years, the, the, the sort of bad journalism that happened in that time led people to believe this. That affects how they go out into the world and interact. We're not presenting a true version of the world in the things that we do. And that Bell example is a great case of that where there's actually, it's just a, a decent story about something nice, but we're like, that's not cynical enough. We need to, we need to tell people what the real world is like out there. It's a bad place. And um, people have gotten tired of that, I think. If you open you know, my website or any others on a Saturday morning just to do some leisurely news reading, like you want to jump off the apartment building by the time you're done, right? It's like people are dying. This, this, this kid has this horrible disease that nobody knows how to solve. Uh, you know, there's chemical attacks everywhere, you would think. People are blowing themselves up every time you turn around. But most of the world isn't like that, right? That's not what happens every day. And there's other things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in a little tighter to that. Um, but some examples is... Um, we ran a, a headline on the CBC site not too long ago, and the headline is this. A quarter of Canadians want Trump-style travel ban poll shows. A quarter. In the subdeck, we call it a sizable minority. What the hell's a sizable minority? It's like a big minority? It like, doesn't even make any sense. 75% of Canadians have zero interest in a Trump-style travel ban. Aren't we great? It's not such a bad story. It's not that you're doing the story differently. You're not hiding the news. You're just taking a different look at it. What about... Um, Justin Trudeau goes in and says in a town hall in Peterborough that he wants to phase out the oil sands. Right? Okay, if you're going to phase out the oil sands, fine. Um, what do we do? We phone the official opposition. We phone Rachel Notley. We phone Jason Kenney. And they're all like, oh, my God, he's awful. He's an awful, awful man, and we hate everything he does. That's the story we present to the world. That's not helpful. That's, nobody needs that story. You're, you know what they're going to say. Uh, the real story is, how would you do that? You know, what's the plan? Has anybody ever phased out the oil sands before or any other big project? What are you going to do instead? It takes no more journalism to do that story on a given day than it takes to phone the leader of the opposition and make him say mad things, or she say bad, mad things about Justin Trudeau. So we need to, to move beyond that. And, you know, how do we do this? Well, to ourselves, we rationalize it, right? We say, this is what we've always done. You know, um, I talked to CEOs when I was a reporter, and they said, like, why don't you ever write good stories about my company? Like, well, shareholders need to know what's really going on, right? You need to know what's really going on. That, that means doing this. We've had this, if it bleeds, it leads mentality, right? A car crash in a neighborhood, we put it in the newspaper. Uh, most people uh, don't like crime news, and they don't like court news. Um, but in all the readership surveys, they always score really high, right? Everybody, it, it's like 80% of people say they love reading about car crashes and, and stabbings and murders and, and hangings and whatever you can think of. But, you know, we're, again, we're framing that the wrong way, though, because that's of the people who read the news, 80% of them like those stories, right? The Globe and Mail circulation is 300,000 people in a country of 37 million, right? Most people don't like those stories, right? The small number of people do. Uh, we say this is what people really want. We talked about that. And then our favorite one is we, we need to reflect the reality, right? This is a scary world we live in. You need to understand that. That's our job to tell you. So what, is it, what has been the consequence of that? Let me read you a list of uh, respected professions in the world. Nurses, number one, everybody loves a nurse, so these are out of five, this is like 4.8. Nurses are amazing. Doctors, sure, policemen, teachers, electricians, accountants. Uh, this is from a survey in Denmark, but it's probably the same here. Home nurses is a different category. Lawyers, child educators, plumbers. Plumbers score very well. Carpenters, truck drivers, communication consultants, pension consultants, bank consultants, taxi drivers, real estate agents, journalists, <laughs> right? And the industry has sort of worn that as a badge of honor over the years. We're like, that's right. You know, we're not here to make you happy. We're here to tell you what's really happening. But we eroded that trust completely. And what happens, you end up with, you know, a situation like Donald Trump where people have sought out other news outlets because they weren't feel they were being listened to. And, and they get there. So Edelman um, is a public relations company, Global. They do a survey every year about trust. And I don't know if many of you have read about this, but, um, you know, I'll kind of close out with this. And Canada historically has been um, a trusting society, according to its data, right? We believe in institutions, um, nonprofits, government, media, and there's one more business, right? We, we tend to believe that everybody's for the good. Um, for the first time in the last year, we've slipped into the distrustful category. We don't trust our institutions. And nobody has felt that more. Uh, than media, which saw a 10% drop last year in trust. So 55% of informed Canadians, so those are people post-secondary education, good jobs, um, trust the media. So that's, you know, it's not, it's not completely dire. 56% is better than 46%. 45% um, of the rest of Canada 
trust the media to, to inform them with accuracy. That's a big problem, right? But the bigger problem is that 90% of people, when asked, say that media is not part of the solution to any of our problems. You know who they think is? Businesses. Businesses. And if you think of the stuff we've been covering at the CBC over the last couple of months, you know, banks are trying to sell you, you know, mortgages, credit cards, and flowers, and, you know, all these upgrades. I just went and renewed my mortgage. I walked out of there with a brand new credit card. I already had a credit card. I got this, like, VIP banking account. Um, I think I might have opened something for my kids. I'm not sure. Um, but that's what people trust, right? We need to fix that. Um, how do we fix that? Um, you know, and this is sort of where everything comes together, is something called constructive news, right? It's not about writing news stories that people want to read because they're nice and warm and fuzzy. It's not about puppies. It's not about cats. It's about writing that news story, but also providing a solution to the problems that you're highlighting, right? It's a fundamental shift in the way newsrooms think about what we do. And I, th I honestly think it's the most important thing we can do to save the news industry. It's not enough to tell people there's a problem. You have to provide some sort of relief valve to say, here's what some people are doing to fix it. Here's what other countries have done. Here's where the opportunities are. Here's what you can do. We do stories at CBC, and because we're a digital news, I could watch how people respond to every single story. I see it in real time. When people started crossing the border into Canada, and, and you know the guy lost his fingers, and we all had this moment where we're like, oh my god, this might be a big deal. Uh, everybody read those stories about the people crossing. Every individual story. Every time we interviewed someone about that story, people read it for a week and then nobody read it, right? Nobody read them anymore. We write stories about indigenous issues. It's, it's where traffic goes to die, right? Nobody reads those stories. Why? Because they know the story already, right? Man crossed into Canada, now he's here, okay. You know, reserves have dirty water, they can't drink their water, they've been boiling it for years, I know. What are we doing about it? Okay, now I'm gonna read. You start to change the focus of that story, you know, what's happening when somebody gets to Winnipeg as a refugee? Where is he staying? What is he doing? Where is his family? Um, you know, how can I get involved? How can I donate money? What's the government doing? What are other governments doing? What are other countries doing? You know, what does Norway do? They have people coming in in the cold. How do they deal with that? People start reading again because there's not a desperation. There's a sense that something else is coming down the road. There's somewhere the story's going. It's not about what happened yesterday. It's about what's happening tomorrow. And I think that's a fundamental shift um, that will save the news. And to sort of wrap it up, um, you know, this isn't about being uncritical, it's not about being superficial or irrelevant or boring or blind to the problems, it's not about the puppies, as I said. It's about doing those hard stories in a way that provides perspective and a true picture of the world, not a, not a skewed picture about how terrible things are. We had a story the other day about a, a, this poor woman from Yellowknife who booked a ticket on Air Canada, um, and then she got to Pearson and, you know, she found out she was on standby. It's like, son of a bitch, isn't that the worst? Like, nobody likes that, right? But this was the number three story on the CBC website. That's not a true picture of the world. That's just making people angry for nothing, right? There's, you know, it's like everybody's been on standby at the airport, except, you know, now Air Canada's mad because we're making them look like they, this poor woman from Yellowknife is being treated differently. Um, you know, so that's, that's where we go wrong. You know, the type of journalism we should be doing offers a way out. It offers hopefulness, education, positivity, and engagement. It gives people a chance to feel like they're engaged with the news they're reading or watching. And with that, I see I'm being um, casually waved off by, by the orange jacket is coming. Um, I was told uh, it would end very badly for me if I, I didn't do that. So thank you very much. And, uh Thank you so much for that really fascinating talk. Uh, I have a whole new perspective on the news, and thank you. And as a small token, we're giving him the, this very interesting book, which many of you will know, The Return of History by Jennifer Welsh. That was a collection of the CBC lectures, and it was really excellent. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've started our morning off in a very fine fashion. And uh, it's time for a little bit of discussion. If you have questions you'd like to pose to the uh, speakers, now's your moment. Yes. I have two mics. So I'm going to hand them oh. right here. All right. I'll leave it to Daphne. <laughs> She's got the mic. <laughs> oh, you already have a mic. All right. You go. I'll figure out how to make this, this one work. This is for uh, Steve. 
Um, I use the CBC uh, website news on the phone all the time, so I really appreciate it. My question is related to the websites of the newspapers, the Star, the Globe, and the National Post. I'm amazed at how much news you can get there for free, and even without seeing any advertisements at all. I just, I, I never checked the Star on the phone, but there, you can go through 10 articles on the Star on the website before a little ad banner comes on, and you just, just go past it. On the Star, you can actually work the crossword without seeing a single piece of advertising. So I don't see how, if people are not buying the newspapers, and that may be because they're going online, but they're also not paying for it by seeing advertising very much. So how long can that continue? Are they just in a pattern now be, before they're going to spring a lot more advertising, or what's going on? I don't see them making money. So the Star is an interesting case because they have their digital tablet app that they want you to use, right? So they spent tens of millions of dollars to make this thing work. Nobody uses it. Um, but in terms of online traffic, a lot of the news you'll see on websites is the stuff that you, they know you can get somewhere else anyway, right? So that sort of commodity news happened today. It's not the deep investigative stuff typically. The global charge you for all that stuff. You know, you hit a paywall on the good stuff. You don't hit it on the fire at this corner and that corner. So they think it's more important just to get you in as a loyal customer and get you coming back to eventually upgrade to that. Um, no, they've been trying for 10 years, right? The, they built a paywall, they knocked it down, they built a tablet, they knock it down. Um, but digital revenue on websites isn't gonna do anything for anybody. It's, it's literally tenths of a penny per article. Nope. Is that me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's not a garbage story and the, the people liked it, right? It's just it's sort of a, it, if you're going to do that story, you need context, right? You're like, it can't just be the lady's mad. It's like, why does this happen? How many flights, you know, it turns out like 1% of Air Canada flights go on standby, right? So, you know, CBC is this big, broad thing where you have networks and, you know, somebody in Yellowknife writes that story. That's a different audience than my national website, right? So in that market, that may be more significant than it is here. We moved that story down once we sort of gave it a read and decided that maybe it didn't need the play that it got. Right, unless you're her, and then it's the, the most important thing that ever happened to you, right? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the mic is over. Okay, here. I'm gonna just, just stand here and take up. Yeah. There was a story. Conservative, uh, uh, a meeting of the conservative leader. Mm -hmm. Was in that was Kevin O'Leary, who yep. wasn't there. That was the whole point of the story. Right. And it seems to me that sort of paradigmical of of the sorts of things that happened, that right. exactly the reason that Trump got so much more free publicity than anyone else. And I'm just very worried that uh, we get a little smug in Canada, and we have mm -hmm, a lot to be sure. smug about compared to the States, yeah. of course, but that, that sort of thing is exactly what people's understandings. Yeah, for like, sure. Is there anything that the news people can do? And yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I can hear you without the microphone anyway. It's fine. It's, like, it's actually harder with the microphone. Um, so we get a lot of complaints that we're only covering um, O'Leary and Leach. Right? But also, they're like the only ones with any support at this point. You know, some people are creeping up a little bit, and we do give some, some ink to some other people, but in terms of, you know, fundraising and, um, you know, getting people out and actually ability to win this thing, it's limited. Is that because the media is only covering them? Probably not. But we're doing the same thing we're doing with Trump, where everybody's like, we'll just write about Dennis O'Leary, or Dennis O'Leary, um, Kevin O'Leary, because... He's not going to win anyway. This is kind of a sideshow, right? And we're doing that exact same thing that happened in the United States. And now they're like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go unless I'm the winner, and I'm not going to be the leader unless I'm prime minister. And everybody's like, well, that's just stupid. Nobody would ever vote for that. And then, you know, we're probably going to be in that situation a year from now. But you know, the solution isn't. You can't ignore his his momentum and his and his progress. You do need to do more about that debate. I agree. And the focus of that story can't be that he's not there over and over and over. And that's what we're doing right now, right? I think him not being there is a good like fourth paragraph of that story. Um, but the, the conundrum and the sort of problem is you can't ignore the people that are winning this thing and are likely to win. And I don't think there's an argument to be made that they're only winning um, because of media coverage. I think that's a cop out. I think they're winning because they're speaking to the base and they're speaking to the base in a way that we just don't listen to in this room, right? Um, typically. Um, I think that's the issue. Wayne Gretzky, too. Yeah. Um, specifically, though, that question for the first speaker, Gary Ryan. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about misinformation and the idea that if you repeat a lie more frequently, then people believe you mm -hmm. because that's exactly what has happened with Trump. And one very, very, I think, investigative story was one guy on Twitter who said, I don't care if they get rid of the Affordable Care Act. I've got Obamacare. No, I don't care if they get rid of Obamacare. I've got the Affordable Care right. Act. It took a lot of people f getting to know him and saying, look, you silly so-and-so, they're, they're the same thing. Now, obviously, there's a problem of misinformation. And it seems to me that the only, you know, you said there's a problem. You're going to try and give us a solution. I mean, one of the solutions would be if everybody was educated enough to realize that that's a lie. Right. But obviously, that's not the truth. Right. And I think with, with Trump, you have a, a unique situation that's never really happened before, where you have someone who seems to be willingly lying. But a lie is an interesting thing. So Peter Mansbridge was asked this the other day during a Facebook Live in the middle of the national. And they're like, why don't you just call people liars? Right? Wouldn't that just solve the problem? Like, Donald Trump lied today about this. But a lie is a very specific, deliberate act intended to deceive, right? It's not, if he believes it, is it still a lie? If he's misinformed himself, is it a lie or is it misinformation, right? And our job as journalists is to correct that misinformation. It's not to call him a liar because we don't know. Sometimes you can, right? Like, some things are just cut and dry. This happened, it didn't happen. But generally speaking, we have to be very, very careful about what we call a lie and what we correct as misinformation. So fact-checking becomes very important. I think in the future, I think journalists have a role in, in providing fact-checking to everything they do. And you know, you're seeing alternate news sites pop up that just fact-check uh, stories and, and politicians and people. What I'd like to uh, ask is, when I look at the media, uh, whether it be print or online, it always says Thompson and Bruder. I mean, it seems to be at one time, it used to be Associated Press, OK? Now Thompson Reuter seems to control the media as far as the news goes. So I mean, if everybody's got the same story, yes. how are you supposed to get this uh, you know, interaction where you actually understand what's going on? Like, I'm getting the story from him, but it's Thompson Reuter. Right. I get it from him, <laughs> it's Thompson Reuter. Yes, if you open every Canadian newspaper today, I mean, Canadian press is in most of them. Um, AP is in a lot of them, and Thompson is the other one. So the reason a lot of people use Reuters is that it's less expensive than the wire services because it, its business is based on the back of the financial services industry, right? So their, their money comes in from people selling bankers' terminals, not from selling us news. Um, but that's a legit problem that when you think of like Canadian newspapers in particular, um, as they've cut costs, the solution has been to replace their own reporters with wire services. And to your point, that's sort of commodity news that everybody has now. You're not getting, you know, the... the the Halifax Chronicle Herald still has a parliamentary reporter in Ottawa. Most papers don't, right? And she's there to write news about Halifax from Ottawa. It's a different type of reporting you're going to do than that person who's writing for The Wire in Ottawa. It's absolutely a problem. But until they figure out the resources and find a way to get reporters back onto the ground, that's, that's the world we're going to head toward for sure. It isn't a good thing. Yeah. I'd, like, I'd like us to get Barry's perspective on these issues. So. We're talking about the problem of misinformation, and you told us about network individualism. It seems to me that probably compounds the problem of misinformation, but could you give us your perspective? Okay, Doesn't matter, I need the exercise. Okay. Look, I was really fascinated with what Stephen had to say, but we are actually getting a fairly diversified amount of news online. Not as good as we could be, or as Steve is getting right now from his Facebook account. Um, but we live, have, when we were in small towns, what, the news was within the small town. And only the elite were getting newspapers. Now we're in a situation of what's sometimes called the filter bubble, which is, we talk to our friends. <coughs> I know people who are genuinely shocked that Trump would win because they talk to only the people who, like myself, were Hillary Bernie people. And they could, I mean, we were actually down in New York to celebrate Hillary's victory. And, and 
two blocks from Trump Tower, and otherwise known as the Bagel White House. And it was a very sad night going on there. But the internet does make it possible to get a lot of news. What the alt news people are uh, doing is getting it from their own internet. I mean, I've read a number of stories online where people asserted that Hillary did this or there were this lies. And, I mean, they're basically, because they talk within their own filter bubbles. Um, so that's, that's happening, but it's always happened. I mean, I'm sad. I mean, I'm a devotee of the New York Times, and I sometimes I feel I'm buying the paper as kind of foreign aid right now. But I'm sad at, at, at the decline of the diversity of information, but most people did not have that diversity before. Most people, even in their local newspapers, were getting a very homogenized uh, situation. Yeah, back there you go. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I mean, to me, one fundamental question that you're both touching upon is, are we getting good information or bad information? Uh, whether it be in the media, the Global Mail, or on uh, the internet. Uh, are we doing worse, or are we doing better in terms of decent news, news that have been properly researched. This is what I'd like to know your opinions. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, th I think what's interesting there, and it, you touched about it just then, is this idea of sort of the filter bubble. And what that really means is you're more likely to t consume the type of news that reaffirms your worldview, right? So, you know, we could all sit in this room and say, like, I had no idea Trump was going to win. But like, there were a million online publications in the US all through the election that says there's no way this guy's gonna lose, right? And if you read like, you know, the Des Moines papers or you know, papers in Ohio, you could get that sense, right? But you tend to consume news that you agree with and you tend to consume news from the same type of people as you in this internet world. So there's lots of information, yes. There's not a lot of news and there's not a lot of reported news. And you know, reported news may not even be the future, right? It fragments out. Uh, citizens can do as good a job, if not better, in a lot of cases of covering a lot of news, and it will go that way to some degrees, but it's still about, um, it's about trust and it's about uh, respectability and accountability. Um, that's what's lacking in all the secondary sources right now is that sort of sense of accountability. What do you do if a story in Breitbart isn't true? Right? It, just, it just will continue to live and they'll feast off its, its glorious page views, um, but we need to get back to a place where the trust is such that people seek it out because right now that doesn't happen. They yeah. just find what comes in their feet and agree Let's with it. Let's not idealize the past. I mean, we all know that Tom Dewey beat Harry Truman in 1948, for example. There's always been misinformation floating around. The, the many alternatives are out there. You have to know how to get them and, and how to subscribe to. Twitter does an interesting job by not doing very much. Uh, it just go, tells me the top stories. Mostly it's about hockey players and stuff like that. But every once in a while, some interesting thing kind of, I think you guys, you're not at Twitter anymore, could have done a lot more with that, but that, that's a private discussion. So um, just like I talked about Tom Brokaw looking to the past, every generation says it was better in the old days. Uh, history, history props looking for another project. I'd love to work with you on that subject. And just to be super clear, I think there's a, like, this is not a fatalistic conversation on my part whatsoever. I think we're on the cusp of actually reinventing news. You know, I think we're moving toward a place where it's gonna be uh, more driven by people, it's gonna be more listening to the audience, it's gonna be finding new opportunities. I do think, you know, the road is clear, everything sort of has failed, which gives us an opportunity to, re to you know, be born again in a sense. Um, so I'm hugely positive about the future. I just think we needed to get to this point before we could start to look ahead. And in a way, Donald Trump has been the great trip, gift that allows uh, journalism to thrive again and get you know, back in the spotlight. You look at the Washington Post, the New York Times, you know, the newspaper battle that's happening there. People are noticing that. People are resubscribing. Um, you know, that's happening in the States. It's not happening here yet. But I do think there is an upward trend. I do think people are going to start to seek out news again. And I do think that news organizations are suddenly remembering why they were important in the first place. On that happy note, I thank you again. And it's time for coffee. Thank you.